Hi, this is Peggy from War. So our guest today is Graham Rodford. Uh, his company is called Archex. It's based in the UK. Thank you so much, Graham, for being with us today. Hi, Peggy. Hi. Nice to have you. Nice to be here. That's fantastic to have you. So could you tell us a bit more uh, about your company and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into uh, the new normal in financial services? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Graham. I'm the CEO, co-founder of Archax in London. Uh, a few years ago, we could see that um, blockchain and DLT technology was starting to take off. We felt like there weren't many credible players in the space and decided to form Archax to be a credible institutional venue in the UK focused on crypto assets. Uh, we applied to the FCA to become a regulated exchange custodian and broker as well as our crypto asset permission. And we received those permissions uh, the, uh, in September uh, of this year. Um, and then final confirmation of our authorization in November. So we're the first digital exchange and virtual asset service provider in the UK. That's uh, very cool. Uh, COVID has not been a wash for you, I guess. It must be very difficult to get this time of approval. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's been, we've had quite a supportive regulator, so it's been okay. COVID hasn't impacted us too much. And, and to some extent, um, it's created an economic landscape which needs more help for SME companies as well. Perspective, what are some of the major lasting impacts that COVID will have uh, on the financial services industry? Yeah, I think uh, the financial services industry is interesting. Um, uh, in places like the UK and other heavily regulated jurisdictions, a lot of financial services companies are required to hold regulatory capital, which I think makes them a bit more stable than other industries. And, and we're seeing you know, the collapse of some high street shops in the UK over the last couple of days and some um, you know, lendings at record highs. And, and the UK housing pricing market is, uh, it, UK housing market is kind of skyrocketing at the moment. So you've got a strange economy. So I think actually mm -hmm. financial services firms are, you know, they're doing a lot of lending, um, you know, and, and, uh, and they're probably not as impacted because they have the regulatory capital and a lot of the times their services are still used in this environment. But obviously, as we start moving forward, I think what you're going to see is that um, when government support starts ending, when we're kind of looking in the aftermath of this, you know, there's going to be, there's going to be higher defaults of loans. I think, you know, lending restrictions will be, will be tightened. Um, you know, there'll be increasing number of defaults. And so there will be an impact. Uh, and not, not only when we're thinking about the big financial services companies, but the UK especially is quite a fintech hub and we have a lot of small financial services companies who are just not going to be able to get the the traction or the investment they need so there will be an impact but uh, you know because there's a bit of a natural buffer around financial services I don't think it will be as great as felt with retail who would really have suffered mm -hmm. and you know that's interesting because we never had this conversation before on the show of uh you know, fintechs falling uh, because to your point, there might not be capital and they're going to run out of money. So um, do you think you're going to see also consolidation, some of these companies being picked up maybe by banks or do you see consolidation from your perspective in the UK? I'd I mean, I'd hope so. We, we, we've been in the space for about three years and we've met, I mean, even our competitors, people in the space, you I mean, so many good people, so many good ideas. And even without the pandemic, you, you know, some of them struggle to raise capital because a lot of the private equity VC companies, they get so many across their desk, it's hard to make a difference. And when you're trying to speak to these banks or, or, um, or larger institutions about investment, you know, it takes a while to get through their process and trying to justify a small strategic investment for them is quite difficult. So I think it's a bit of a struggle. I think if you can develop a relationship and you've got time, there's a chance that, that a larger institution, you know, may support the smaller institution. But but it's going to be hard in this environment. So I think, uh, you know, your point about consolidation might, consolidation might be the right one that, you know, maybe two or three smaller players that have complementary services, let's say like a Neo bank with a, with a crypto platform, if they come together, there's a chance that, that they're better able to survive. Yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, so, so do you think if we look a bit more from a policies and regulation perspective, you spoke obviously of loan default and we, we all more or less expecting that. Uh, do you feel we're going to see new policies and regulations being put in place uh, to manage this new normal in, in financial services? 
Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think, uh, and again, within our space, within the blockchain space, you know, even that's a fast moving industry and the, the regulation and the legal framework can't really keep up with the pace of innovation. Um, mm. and it, all of the, all of the governmental departments, um, you know, they're all going to, they're all going to be struggling at the moment with dealing with a lot of different things at once, you know, w- working out how people are locked down. How do we, you know, how do we prioritize operations? How do we make sure the schools are running there's a lot going on so i don't think that you will see rapid changes to regulation and law unless there's something that's really um you know that really inhibits growth within the economy i just i just don't think it'll be fast enough i think there'll be some support there i hope where the government choose to invest their money is incredible um, investment opportunities where the government maybe takes stakes in small fintech businesses which generally offer an opportunity and companies like Archax, i mean we're building an sme growth market in the uk we're, we're trying to allow companies better ways of accessing capital so so supporting companies like us may actually help them make further advances into supporting the economy. Yeah, it's, it's a one too many, you know, relationship. So that's definitely worthwhile to have. Uh, and, you know, other types as well of, of funding, because uh, it's, it's a bit difficult for large financial institutions very often to lend to SME. Very, exactly. You know, they're used to very specific boxes, yeah. And if you're out of the boxes, well, too bad for you. And now there is no boxes anymore with COVID. So it, it's, it's a big struggle for them. Exactly. And the government, I mean, it's great that, you know, the government push and say, we're going to encourage banks to lend, banks should lend more, we want to do their support loans. But the reality is, those banks are companies as well. They also need to survive and they can't write big books of business where they know they're going to lose money. I mean, why would they do it? Even if, you know, even if the government's going to underwrite some of it, they need to protect their balance sheet for their own shareholders. So they still need to make sensible decisions. And, you know, lending to lending to a high street SME in the mid pandemic, where there's no footfall for the best part of seven months is you know not necessarily the best lending decision you know i'm not i'm not sure many people would you know without knowing the time frame of a vaccine or when we come out of it it's quite difficult to justify making that loan so uh you know we need to think of alternative ways for companies to raise capital as much support as possible without compromising the kind of you know the future integrity of of the amount of debt that this that, that this company can take on yeah, exactly this country so well, talking about debt and talking about, you know, country debt. So uh, we've seen unbelievable amounts of sovereign debt, uh, you know, cranking up every month and uh, you don't see uh, the end uh, in sight. Uh, so, so what impacts do you see COVID having in terms of global financial stability and order? Yeah, it's really, it's really hard, uh, you know, and I'm no expert and people debate that the economy may back, bounce back fast. Um, seems quite unbelievable that we could have spent nine months at home and there not be any impact at all. Mm-hmm. I think, um, you know, there's, you know, like if I just take our business, for example, our business has pretty much not been affected at all. So, you know, everyone's been getting paid. We haven't used furlough, but then there's obviously, you know, hospitality, tourism, airlines, um, you know, there's all, all of these, you know, with you know, national airlines kind of going under and, you know, large chains of retail shops going under. So there's definitely going to be a, a bit of a struggle. We can't, you know, it feels like, the, you know, there could be a bit of a global recession, mm-hmm. um, but, but we're quite... Um, you know, there have been worse cases in the past where we've bounced back. Um, you know, we do have some technological advantages now with, you know, imagine being in this situation when we couldn't leave the house. I think the world would have ground to a halt, but actually we could, you know, everyone can pretty much maintain some semblance of normality and technologies enabled even restaurants to adapt their business model, to be able to deliver from home and let people pick up. So, um, you know, I think, you know, there's no doubt that there will be an impact. It's, it's hard to know yet how big that impact will be. But needless to say, the sooner the sooner that we get out of it, the better. I think being in this middle ground of, um, you know, the economy's back on, the economy's back off, uh, it's you know, quite hard to know when we come out of it. And also mentally for people, I think, you know, having one constant or the other is probably a good thing. Flip-flopping between the two, I think, creates real instability. Yeah, and you know, obviously, instability and uncertainty is what investors don't like. Uh, you know, that's the worst thing an investor <laughs> is going to see. Yeah. They don't know for sure the situation is awful <laughs> or excellent, yeah. but not uncertainty. So, so that that creates a, a lot of challenges. Um, in terms of resetting competitive positioning, obviously, this time of 
massive dislocation that we're living through right now create opportunities uh, that uh, create opportunities for organization like yours for other type of organization uh, what type of uh, financial organization uh, do you think will benefit from uh, from covid and the crisis mm. um well, hopefully, hopefully there are genuinely some angles for companies like ours that are, that are trying to allow private cap private companies to reach more capital. So, you know, in the past, you can kind of go for a listing or you can do crowdfunding. I think we're going to see an increasing presence of SMEs trying to raise money. Um, and that's necessary because you've always got investors looking for places to to find yield, especially in low interest rate environments. So having better marketplaces where companies can raise money and investors can find those investments, I think that's helpful. Um, obviously, um, any form of uh, any form of um, technological uh, advancement. So I think you know if you just had a high street bank and that was your model before, you're probably in a lot of trouble. Where if you've got a neo bank that can run from your phone, uh, you know you can you can pretty much control everything from the comfort of your own home without needing to go anywhere else. Uh, I think companies that um, you know also just enable enable networking so raise money from multiple brokers so you've got angel networks you've got companies like primary bid in the uk which are letting retail people participate in ipos this kind of connection between people um and, and investments i think are, are probably critical ones and if you look at financial institutions traditional banks uh or do you see these organization transforming right now uh, i I mean, I don't really see massive transformation, if I'm honest. In fact, I think banks move disappointingly slowly. I think um, there, if we, if we just look at um, uh, cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology over the last three years, it's been an, an ever present problem to allow crypto asset companies to get bank accounts, even though some of them like us are trying to legitimately operate. And when you think over the last three years, what's changed, the bank's attitudes haven't changed, but we've seen regulation coming into several countries. Uh, and also to the point where banks such as the Bank of England are talking about introducing central bank digital currencies. So you've got this perverse situation where they've totally missed out on this whole wave. And if the banks had been there to support those companies in the middle, um, they would have been able to make more of an impact to the economy, I'd argue. Uh, so I don't see them changing much right now. If I was sitting in a bank, I suspect the conversation is more about tightening the tightening the lending restrictions. I mean, house prices are going through the roof. Everyone's moving. Stamp duty is low. People are probably moving out of cities right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of debt being taken on there in one of the worst economic conditions mm -hmm. ever. So I think banks will be you know, tighten in, tighten in their lending book as much as possible. And maybe we'll start to see those um, restrictions increasing. Yeah. And, and, you know, but funny, I was listening last week to Christine Lagarde, who's now uh, in charge of the ECB. And, and she was saying that we're going to see a, a, a normal recession coming if banks start tightening to the credit, you know, because it's going to be the, this recession has been really much service led. So retail, hospitality, that type of thing. While a traditional recession is industrial and manufacturing, what's going to happen to your point is that banks are going to start to tighten their book regardless of where you are. And then you're yeah. going to go in that second cycle of recession. So that's, uh, that's, that's going to be um, interesting to see if the central bank are going to be able to manage their financial institutions to actually still continue to lend and not create a second recession you know so yeah and yeah i suspect i suspect they'll tighten if i just think if you've got lending criteria before it must be a worse economic outlook you know you surely must tighten you surely must be expecting a higher rate of defaults with unemployment and and um and uh, lending reaching record highs yeah i i agree with you Talking about changes and uh, maybe a, a, a lighter topic. So, so what did you change or what did you change at your company during the last uh, few months? Did you pick up new habits? Uh, anything that is Gram 2.0 in uh, 2020? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a struggle. There's the things that are, I mean, the company hasn't really been affected, right? And you know, I'm, I and a lot of my staff are quite self-sufficient and we can work, but. You know, staying, um, you know, I trust everyone I work with, but understanding what everyone's working on all the time is a struggle without phoning up everyone and saying, what are you working on right now? How are you prioritizing? Which is, you know, quite aggressive. But finding ways of doing that 
uh, is a challenge, but I think the most, the difficult one is for the junior members of staff, actually, mm -hmm. you know, when you, when you first join a company, you, you usually have someone that teaches you, you might have a procedure manual in front of you and you also learn through osmosis of everyone in the, in the company, but actually, you know, we've got quite a lot of new starters. It's their first job and they're sat at home and for them, this is their first job. And, you know, and, and I am so busy. My team is so busy remembering to pick up the phone and talk them through things and teach them. It's quite a challenge. So I feel really sorry for those people. I hope it's, uh, you know, I hope they're not missing out on a critical bit of learning and instead learning new ways of interaction that just we wouldn't have appreciated. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the knowledge transfer is a big, big challenge of this working from home. People like you or I who have already made these learnings and learned through osmosis, we, we probably don't see that. But this new generation that has been at work from zero to five years, if not seven years maybe, uh, they really, really miss on you giving them some subtitles after an email, a conversation, a meeting. Now it's just like, okay, well, the meeting is finished, goodbye. And Okay, more exactly. work. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I guess you know from your question, I guess one thing is I, I, you know, I've, I've tried to use more words in my emails rather than just assuming everyone knows what I'm talking about when I send quick emails. Just trying to explain the context a little bit more. Yeah, 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 that's for sure. And for you, did you pick up a new habit, a new hobby? Are you learning to speak French? Are you, uh, you know? <laughs> May not. Uh, I don't, uh, <laughs> I, I uh, no, not really. I mean, to be honest with you, I've got three children. I'm, you know, I quite, I must admit, one of the upsides of this is that I get to see my kids at breakfast, lunch and dinner a lot of the times when they're at home. They're back at school now. I still see them when they come in from school. So whilst I tend to tell them to go away when they come into the office, at least I get to see them when I tell, <laughs> tell them that. So, yeah, you're just spending a bit more time with the family and trying to appreciate, you know, this opportunity to, to be with those people that you wouldn't usually be with if you were stuck in an office. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's I think, one of the biggest upsides to be able – I have – a husband and we also have a pet and we're like oh well, we're so happy because we're spending our time with our cats you know and i don't know she's going to be absolutely uh, infuriated when we go back to the office <laughs> exactly yeah Okay. That'll be that'll be like her lockdown then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But thank you so so much, Graham, for taking the time today. I really appreciate it, and and thank you for your thoughts. That was extremely valuable. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yes, bye.